What makes a session musician different from others is their quality of musicianship and their versatility to play all styles of music. Learning how to operate an audio interface, a microphones, on how to operate a mic preamp has been essential for musicians to get hired. Hi guys, this is Moises from Singular Sound, and in this video, we're going to learn how to become a studio guitarist with one of the most versatile players here in the South Florida music scene. His name is Camilo Velandia, and we're so happy to have him in this video conversation. So let's get into it. So this is one of the two videos about this trending topic. So make sure to check out Camilo's complete gear rundown right here. He shares how he records the best quality audio from the comfort of his home. So just to give you a little bit of background about this incredible player, Camilo has performed as a touring musician in more than 45 countries. He has recorded with Grammy winning and nominated artists such as Julio Iglesias Sr., Jennifer Lopez, Luis Fonsi, and Julio Iglesias Jr., just to name a few. Camilo has been a longtime supporter for the Beat Buddy and the Aerosloop Studio, so we're so happy to have him in this video conversation. Let me ask you this question, of course, since we're talking about how to become a session musician. So what are the skills you need to have uh, in order to become a studio musician? How do you become one, Camilo? The way I started was I would just ask my friends that I was doing, you know, top 40 gigs with if they needed a session guitarist, you know. And then of course, at the beginning, you have to start with your rates all the way at the very bottom because you don't have the training and, you know, you may have to do a session and they'll come back to you and tell you that you were clipping all over the place and you have to do it again, <laughs> you know. So you can't be charging what the what the session guys are charging at first, you know. But But eventually, you know, the more you do it, everybody's usually pretty open you know and if you if you're kind of cool and humble about it and ask for feedback everybody shares and, and you know everybody everybody will tell you um and you know at, at the end of the day nobody knows everything i'm always asking guys too what what they thought of my guitars and what i could do to get them better you know and and, and it's one of those things where like I think we you just have to jump in the water and learn how to swim when you're in the water, you know? Like, if you think about it too much, you're going to be like, oh, no, if if Tim Pierce does sessions, like, what am I doing doing sessions? Like, forget it, you know? So it's one of those things where you kind of learn as you go. But, I mean, definitely a couple of things that you can do to prepare is just, you know, being able to do simple things like strumming with a click, you know, playing rhythm with a click, playing... Uh, you know, if you play in a top 40 band or something like that, that's super, that's a great training ground, you know, because you learn how to play rhythm guitar. I mean, most of the time we're playing rhythm guitar. So if you spend all your time working on solos, it's, it's you're going to have a hard time trying to break into this, you know, because uh, most of the songs don't have solos, you know, but all the songs have rhythm guitar. And, and sometimes you have to play, um, you have to play to a click and sometimes you have to, you glue with the drummer you know which is a feel thing that is hard to quantize and make sound correctly you know you kind of have to be a combination of a lot of things you know you have to be you have to learn about engineering how to record yourself um how to how to like edit what you record you know so you have to have some knowledge of editing um also the marketing side of things what we were talking about earlier like uh being on social media, being able to do video stuff, which is <laughs> a challenge for me still, you know. Um, but those are very important things nowadays because it is a competitive market, you know. Like we're kind of like comp competing with the whole world nowadays because you can hire somebody from, you know, Norway to record your, your guitars. So that's that's kind of like the business side of things, you know. But definitely uh, being able to access different guitar sounds, you um, if I want to be able to get like a like a classic 80s power chord sound or power ballad guitar solos, you know, having the right gear to get you there, whether it's digital or analog, you know, if it's like an analog kind of like a Marshall with a tube screamer and or if it's a digital thing with like a, you know, like the 
the new row or the fractal or line six, whatever it is. But I mean, those are all just tools, you know? I think the sound, we have to get it in our head and then you use different tools to get it. I mean, I can get the same sound just with the fractal or going in through the amps or, you know, because really what you're trying to get is the sound that causes an, an emotion, you know? So being able to get those sounds, being able to get like a, I kind of always like categorize different styles of music and save playlists of, uh, you know, different guitar sounds that I that I like to reference, you know, if it's like a real um, boutique kind of a raw guitar sound that's more roomy then you know, I, I have like room plugins or if it's like a springy thing or if it's like a slapback thing or if it's like a Marshall thing or a Vox thing or a Fender thing, you know, the British distortion, American distortion. I, I'm always thinking of those things when I'm when I'm thinking of a guitar sound. And if it's an acoustic thing, you know, if it's like a, a roomy thing as well, or if it's like a really clean guitar up in your face, then you got to use some compression, some preamps. So being able to be aware of those sounds and how to get them, you know, um, there's lots of information on YouTube and, and on Google and Wikipedia on how, like, David Gilmore used to record his guitars or how, or who engineered this or who engineered that and, you know... I definitely look all that up. You know, I've seen tons of interviews with Manny Marroquin and, and on how he mixed, you know, Continuum with John Mayer, you know. And I watch interviews with, with you know, Chris Oraji on how he mixes this guy. And, you know, you, you kind of have to do your research for sure, you know. Um, and then being able to play the part as well, you know, having the chops to be a session guy. Like, one of the things is I... You know, if a, if a client comes over and I start playing, I don't want to have to learn how to play guitar while the client is here, you know. I kind of just have to play something that will inspire them and, and and I have to see their reaction. If they're digging it or not, I'll play something else. But there's no room for me to sit here and, and, and play wrong notes and, and things like that, you know. And and much less if it's in a studio where somebody's playing for paying for studio time, you know. So I kind of have to get there and be ready to to you know access this guitar sound on the fly and they're ready to record you know um so that's an important skill to have as well and i mean those are all things that you can find online i mean uh follow guys like tim pierce and tom bukovac and, and Derek wells you know those session guys that are always sharing information and and you can you know if anybody follows me feel free to ask me anything i'm, I'm an open book and uh and then you know the whole recording side of things you know getting yourself an interface getting yourself acquainted with, uh, with with the kind of historic gear that has always been used, you know, like compressors like the 1176, the LA-2A, you know, how are they used, what are they used for, in what kind of scenario you would use those, you know. And uh, it's definitely a never-ending thing, and, and, and if you're into it, it's really fun, you know. I, I enjoy it so much because I'm so geeky about that stuff. But I know some guys that are not, and... and and that's totally cool too, you know. Some there are some guys that are, they just know about their guitar and their pedals and their amp, and they they just show up and they play with the thing. And and those guys work too, you know. But I guess it's just a at the end of it all, oh, it's also like a people skills thing, you know. You have to be a likable person that'll 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 not be a drag, you know. Absolutely, I think that's one of the main ones. I think you need to be just a really responsible guy that it shows up on time plates great great has good tone and you're i mean i can totally see you're one of the guys you know like you, you i mean you're you're an amazing musician and you're just such a such a cool dude man so for sure <laughs> i totally agree uh, with you on that so how do you how do you record the guitars real quick like on on this setup okay so i usually i start with a guitar you know i pick which which electric i want to use I can either go into a couple of pedal boards here that would be like my pedal boards that go into the front of the amp. And so those are all just usually different kinds of boosts or different kinds of drives, you know. And um, I decide if I want to use a fractal or an amp. And I've, I've gotten them both to sound the same, so I don't pick one because it's better than the other. I mean, I, I pick them because I want to mess around with different things, you know. But if so, I want to use so let me fractal, ask you. So you have them all to like connected together, so you, yeah. so you can switch around between exactly. them. Exactly. So I have five Very amps cool. here, and they they're all going into a load box. I mean, you know, I have to switch whichever amp I want to use. 
but I go into a load box and then the load box goes into the fractal. And so I can choose if I want to use the amp into the fractal and then I'll use the cabinet emulation, right? So really where the cab happens in the fractal, that's where they meet. So either, either I use direct and I'll use the amp from the fractal and the drives from the fractal, or I'll use pedals and the amps and then I'll go into the fractal and then from the cab emulation, then we go into a bunch of like wet effects like dry uh, delays, reverbs. And then I have another uh, uh, analog like delays and reverbs here that I can stick in the chain at that point, you know, but it's, it's all a matter of what kind of sound I'm looking for. And then I split the signal so that my dry signal goes uh, stereo uh, by itself and then the wet signal goes stereo by itself as well so like uh, it'll be like a hundred percent wet you know and then I decide if my wet if my dry signal if it's just an amp signal that's mono then I'll only record mono if it's like a stereo chorus or like a tremolo with a ping pong or something like that then I'll record the dry signal as a stereo you know so I'll give you an example of that so <clears throat> this is this is kind of like just the main amp sound. Right, that's just like one of the amps I have on the fractal. I'll show you some other ones. This is like my match, match list, which is kind of like a Vox. So this kind of amp, I would use it. I have a fractal pedal here too that I can add to, you know, like a brightness. Right, and then here's a basement. Right, I think I'm clipping the preamp here a little bit. Cause I have a, I also have some preamps that I use here from Universal Audio. So here I'm using the. So this is like a Helios, which is like a was really famous in the Led Zeppelin. Uh, they used those a lot for acoustics, electrics, all that stuff, you know? And so uh, here's a JTM 45, which is like the... Flexi. And then this would be like my heavy Marshall. And then again, that's, that's all dry. So when I add the wet to it, which is a separate stereo, we get that. Wow. Right? And then I can add a boost to that. That would be like my 80s uh, lead sound, you know? Or if I wanted to add like a, a chorus to that to make it even more 80s. So let, me, so let me ask you something, Camilo. So, and then your effects, do you have already a preset or or you tweak them on the fly or you just have something yeah. that you always recall in every session? You just have I, something that you can work with, right? I, l I think of, you know, even though it's digital, I'm thinking of it also like... Um, like if it was analog. So I have eight different amps that I set up on the fractal, right? Wow. And then those eight different amps, I have like four, really it's like 16 different cabs that I can access on the fly. And then those are the same cabs that I would use if I was using the same, the, the, the real amps, right? And then, and then everything else I tweak on the fly. So I don't have any, I don't have like a, power ballad solo preset no I, I tweak it you know i would go to the plexi i would find the drive that works for that guitar and so i kind of tweak it on the fly there and then all my post eqing i would do here on like the universal audio channel strips if i use like the helios or if i use a neve and then i could add like tape saturation all of, and then all of that stuff goes recorded already into pro tools so I can't take any of this off. It's already printed, you know? So actually, I was going to ask you something about, uh, since, you know, I'm a drummer, uh, we are, 
we 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 promote that the beat buddy of course a drum machine so h how do you deal with live drummers uh, and bad timing on a track for example so i mean that's one thing that's one thing that is super uh useful you know the beat buddy because the beat buddy it's like a human drum machine you know so it's a really good uh it's a, a really good scenario where you can practice playing with good feel you know it's very different from practicing with a metronome right uh because you as a drummer you know that sometimes playing a groove exactly to the grid is not necessarily the best feeling thing you know like especially things like a shuffle or something it's like there are certain shuffles where it's like okay is it is it it's not really a triplet but it's not really dotted either it's like somewhere in between and if you try to quantize things like that it, it just sounds so bad you know so things like that i mean the beat buddy is great for practicing things like that because you at the end of the day we're making music and the click is just a reference you know um so if i get a session where the drummer is like off usually i'll, I'll ask the producer like hey are the are, is anybody going to quantize the drums you know because if somebody's going to quantize the drums and i need to record now they're on a time on a time frame then i'm going to record to the click and expect them to fix the drums later you know if they tell me they're not going to quantize the drums then i'm going to try i'll shut off the click and i'll just try my best to 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 play with the drummer and then you know i'll go back and slide things afterwards edit them to make me sound like um you know i like guess make him sound good i guess if you will um right because some styles of music just don't lend themselves to playing with a click like you know like if you listen to all that old led zeppelin stuff i mean if you try to quantize that stuff right. it'll kill it it'll just destroy the whole vibe of it you know absolutely and, and none of those guys were were playing to a click or or you know it's like some of those styles of music just don't lend themselves to playing with a click or if it speeds up and it slows down and it speeds up and it slows down um it's one of those things but i definitely always ask you know uh do you you know if the if, if i notice that the drums are a little bit loose i'll ask okay do you want me to lock in with the drums or do you want me to lock in with the grid and then are you going to fix it later you know that's very interesting yeah of course you need to have a a really really just strong pulse and and groove you know i think that's the soul of the song you know, yeah bottom line totally um so let me ask you, Camilo. So, do you think you can get any better as a musician? And if so, how would you achieve that? How will you do it? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I, you can ask my wife. I constantly have days of the week where I'm like, I suck at guitar. I hate this. <laughs> like, I hate this stupid instrument. You know. <laughs> so I, there is so like the I guess the road that I chose to take. There's so much information and i and i am so i'm so incredibly I, I can't emphasize how addicted i am to growing as a musician like you know like one of the things that scares me the most and like like just like almost disgusts me is the idea of being in the same place in like six months or a year you know what i mean so i feel like i always have to be learning something different you know i i have to learn how to use something different i have to learn how to use a synth a new synth, you know, so I'll buy like plugins just to keep myself learning new things, you know, and there's so much stuff to learn. I mean, I, you know, I, I started practicing recently again. So just practicing with the metronome, you know, just practicing different things, you know, going back to basics. Yeah, because there's always so much to learn. I mean, I, I have days where I'll show up at a session and then things just flow and I'm and I'm like, man, yeah, I, I sounded great today, you know. And then I have days where I sit here, and I'm like, man, who am I kidding, dude? You know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it's just one of those things where like, um, there's, you can't, you have to keep yourself, and you know, I, I always compare myself to like what I consider to be like the top of the top of the top, and so like my expectations for what I need to be doing always keep getting further and further away so i always keep chasing them you know so i i definitely think that everybody you know if you think if you think that you've you're already at the level where you want to be then you might as well just die or quit you know because <laughs> what's the point you know what's the point absolutely it's man. never ending and i mean i wish i had more time i so i could learn drums or sax or something you know 
Okay, so th I wanted to ask you this question uh, because I think it's so important for musicians to really know about this, about how to record themselves. So what do you say? What would you say to a young musician that doesn't know anything about recording gear or, or microphones or preamps? Do you, do you think it's a necessary or an essential skill for today's music industry? Yeah, I think so because we're moving more and more in the direction where Uh, you know, before they, they would, there would be a budget where they would block out a studio and then they would be paying an engineer to be there and then they would be paying an assistant to mic up. And, and you know, that still is the case uh, in a lot of scenarios, but a lot of times it's just, you know, budgets are, are, are short, so you kind of have to record. If you're trying to be a session person, to be working all the time, you've kind of, you kind of have to have a, a recording setup. And uh, that being said, it's very accessible. I mean, all the interfaces nowadays are great. They, you know, there was a time when you kind of had to buy something above a certain price range to get good converters and, and things like that. But nowadays, even like the cheap ones have really good sounding converters. And and now there's so much software too, like you know things like Isotope and companies like that that offer like kind of like sound correction and you know, removing the room and remove, you know, like I was watching a, a, a breakdown of a Justin Bieber song and like, uh, love yourself, you know, where it's just like guitar and, and voice. And, uh, and you know, the mixer was like showing the isolated guitar before he did anything to it. And it was like recorded in a buzz and there's a, there's like this horrible noise on it and it sounds terrible. And it's like, if you, if you think about it, it's like he took that where it's like completely naked, just guitar and vocal and turned it into a, you know, a radio song. Uh, and the guy wow. recorded it in a bus and, a, you know, probably with a little a cheap interface or whatever. So, I mean, it can be done. I think it's just a matter of getting yourself a, a good cheap interface, you know, watch, definitely inform yourself, ask around, uh, ask in studios, ask your engineer friends, watch videos. I mean, YouTube is like an encyclopedia of this stuff, you know, but uh, getting course. maybe like a two channel interface, one for, Maybe if you want to have two inputs, maybe like a vocal mic or a, maybe a, a mic to record guitars and then maybe a, a, an input for a guitar. And then um, there there are really good plugins to emulate, um, you know, preamps and compressors and stuff. So maybe with just that, you can get started and eventually invest in a good microphone and a good preamp. But I mean, once you get into the microphone thing, you really have to start thinking about your room treatment as well, because that's super important so i mean you can definitely get started and, and get a lot of stuff done with with your beginning rig but there's ways to grow for sure yeah absolutely i think just to have your setup to just to create your own demos your own songs just to have something that you can you can just create you know i think it's so important and like, like you said there's so many affordable audio interfaces that you can even record on your phone And, and good quality stuff and not that really that expensive. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's a great, great advice. So how many guitars do you bring to a session if you go to, if you go to a studio? And how do you know which sound you're going before you start recording tracks, before they, they press rec? You know, I, I always like to record here best because everything is already set up. And, you know, if I have to reach for a mandolin... Because it's happened to me sometimes where they'll ask me to bring certain things. And then once we're there, we're, they're like, oh, yeah, do you have a... Yeah, I have one at home. You know, it's like... So I think I try to get as much information as I can. Like, what kind of song is it? What kind of guitars they're going to want? If they can send me a rough of the song for me to hear. Uh, but generally, I'll take like one or two electrics, you know, some kind of like a Strat type. And then something with humbuckers, you know. Uh, this guitar is super versatile because I've got the humbuckers and I can do this the coil split. So maybe I'll take this and like a Strat. Or sometimes a client will have a very visual thing of what they want. Like they'll be like, they, I want a hollow body or something because they relate that to the to the type of music, you know. So then I'll take that. And then, you know, if it's like an acoustic, again, if I'm thinking like a, if it's like a bright pop thing, I'll take my Taylor. Or if it's like a darker sounding thing, maybe my Martin. And then, um, and then uh, maybe they'll ask for something specific, like can you bring a mandolin or a twelve string? And then uh, usually I take my my fractal pedal board, and um, 
I don't usually take an amp unless they request one. Usually, if they have a studio, maybe sometimes they have an amp. But most of the time, when I when they ask me to bring an amp and I take it, we end up not using it. <laughs> so, the last couple of times I've taken an amp to a session, we've ended up not using it. Um, but you know, it, it's always different. So let's say that you can't find the right tone or the right sound at the session, um, and or you're just not feeling it. What do you do next? I think usually if I can't find the right sound or or the right tone, it, it's usually because I'm tired or you know I need to take a break or something. You know because I think I think there are so many palettes of sounds for guitars. You know like I. I kind of draw from different things. Like I, I think of like the people, you know, people want to hear things that they're familiar with, you know, for, for the most part, nobody hires me to create this one thing that nobody said. I mean, of course, everybody wants their song to be unique. And, and of course I'm not recycling things from, from client to client, but, but you know, like people want to hear like a John Mayer type of thing, or maybe they want to hear like a Neil Sean type of solo or, uh, you know, like they want to hear things that that they they kind of relate to, like a hit song or something. You know, so right. I I kind of draw from those things. I I think of you know, is it is it going to be like a very organic raw kind of guitar sound, or is it going to be more of like a really processed thing, almost like a sample, like a Sean Mendes type of acoustic guitar, or like an Ed Sheeran type of thing. So I kind of draw from there, and I mean I've I've never not been able to get the sound. I think sometimes it's it takes more like sometimes it'll be more than just guitar amp pedal sometimes i'll have to record that and then go into pro tools and maybe saturate it or maybe add like a micro shift to make it a, a wider or or maybe duplicate it and mess with the other one so like i'll do stuff like that to it to where it you know it's way different in the final uh stage than it was when i first started recording it but uh but yeah, I mean, going back to it, if if I can't get the sound, it's usually because I'm tired or or I need to take a walk or something, you know, or maybe get listen to something and get inspired in the style of music or, or something like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We have our, our creative uh, blocks sometimes and you just have to do what you need to do. I think to taking a break, it's always, it's always good. So as a studio musician, do you get any chance to get creative while you're recording the song or you just play what the producer or the artist wants i usually ask um because i i kind you know i i stand on the i guess on the on the stool where everybody has different ears and i have to kind of service what the what the artist wants for for their song you know i mean they've they've written the song they've been sitting on this song for a long time you know years sometimes so for me to come and try to kind of uh impose my idea of the song can sometimes be a uh, a delicate thing, you know, and, and sometimes it's not taken well. So I, I always ask what they want first, and I always record that first, you know. So sometimes they'll tell me, okay, you know, we want, say, say they send me a song. I'll say, okay, what kind of guitars do you picture on this? You know, send me some references. So some people might be specific and send me like a, you know, maybe they'll send me a Katy Perry song and be like, okay, I like the guitar from the verse. If you can do this for the verse, something similar, and then I like this, uh, you know, I like the Shawn Mendes song, what what they did in the chorus. So if you can do that, so I I try to get as much of that information as I can, because I mean I can certainly sit there and record three different versions of the song, and they may all sound great to me and to the producer, but then the artist might hate it, you know, and and a lot of times that happens where I'll send a lot of tracks and they'll love all of it, and then they'll hate that one that I thought was the coolest one, you know, or, and then we'll zoom and then they'll have me record something that I hate. And they're like, yeah, that's what I want. That's perfect. Oh my gosh. And they're like in tears, you know? So, <laughs> so it's always, it's like a weird thing, but I think if you can kind of get it into your head that everybody has different ears and you can't take anything personal, then, you know, that's a good, that's a good mentality to always try to go back to, you know? Absolutely, man. That's so interesting. That's so interesting that you share that thought. Uh, let me ask you, so what's your favorite piece of recording gear at your studio? I mean, definitely my, my most useful one is definitely the, the Axe FX, you know? Um, just because it's the main hub for everything. And I mean, it's such a versatile unit. Like if I, 
if I had to move to a deserted island and I could just want, take one piece of gear and a guitar it, with that I could probably get most of the stuff done. But I love I love microphones and the interaction of a microphone with like a compressor or a preamp and just like using the room like I, I always find that to be fascinating. So just kind of like uh, capturing a sound with a microphone, I, I always think that's very fun to do, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a drummer and I'm always experimenting with the mic placements and stuff because you just move the microphone a little farther and it's like... It's like, you know, it sounds completely different, you know, so you can have yeah. those, you, you can play around and it's like a, ne a never ending game, you know, so sure. I feel you on that. Um, and especially with drums, it's like sometimes pushing things too far has a, has a sound that sometimes is really cool and, 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 and it's a very cool thing sometimes to turn something all the way up yep. and record with that and then, and then that's kind of like the, the vibe of the song and then. You know that certainly has a, a a cool thing to it. You know, absolutely, man. Um, so let me ask you this: so I know you about your ex extensive career of playing with many artists in a lot of different genres of music. With you know, like I said, with a lot of different artists. Uh, how do you develop that sound and knowledge, Camilo? Um, and how do you, yeah, how do you keep up with with everything that is happening? Well, I think a lot of it is just. The biggest, the biggest thing is having the respect for all the types of music, you know, um, because I, I, I can enjoy listening to, you know, Chris Cornell, just like I can enjoy listening to Justin Bieber, just like I can enjoy listening to, you know, Pat Metheny or something like that. And, and everything has its, its things that are difficult to do. You know, sometimes we, we overlook or, or kind of like, uh, look down on certain types of music, but then until you have to do them yourself it's it's a little bit of a tricky thing you know so one of the, i i always 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 i'm always exploring always like trying to watch youtube videos i have memberships on like mix with the masters and pure mix and you know i watch the slate academy things like i'm always trying to learn as much as i can uh on like mixing mastering recording everything i can and i always try to constantly check what's new also on the radio because you kind of like one of my fears is like repeating myself too much, you know, like I don't want to, I kind of have to always do something to reinvent what I'm doing to try to keep it different and fun, you know. So um, that's definitely something that you, f you focus on. I definitely spend a lot of mind energy <laughs> trying to plan and strategize things to keep me learning and changing, you know. Well, thank you so much, guys, for watching this video conversation about this trending topic. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media at Singular Sound. We're going to be putting out more videos about the Aeros Loop Studio updates. So stay tuned on that. And also, don't forget to watch Camilo's complete gear rundown at his home, where he dives in into his favorite gear and sounds. But in the meantime, keep rocking, keep looping, and keep doing what you love. Adios.